Thank you, and once again, good morning to students and teachers of the Word of God. We have a lesson here before us on this Sunday morning called Peter's Report. And Peter's report is his first report that he makes after the resurrection of Christ when he gives you the material found in Acts chapter 2. That's Simon Peter reporting all through Acts chapter 2. And, of course, none of us is aimed at a Christian because there are no Christians there. And none of us aimed at the body of Christ because nobody knows the body of Christ is there. And so there's no blood atonement mentioned. The Bible tells you if you're a teacher, you're to study to show yourself to prove unto God, and you are to rightly divide the word of truth. And the places in the Bible where people go to hell quoting Scripture, and God knows many of them know Scripture or quote Scripture before they go to hell, the devil quotes Scripture to Christ. Did you know that? He quotes part of Psalm 91 to Christ in one that at the temptation. You can make that book tell, teach anything if you'll do one of three things with it. Anybody can make that Bible teach anything if it'll add a word to the Bible that isn't in there, or subtract a word from the Bible that is in there, or take a passage out of the context. And that way, the devil is a great Bible scholar, the greatest Bible scholar that ever lived on this earth outside of the Christ himself. Don't you worry, the devil knows that book from cover to cover, including the cover. And here in where you're getting ready to study in Acts chapter 2, you have Peter standing up and talking for an hour or so, and not once does he mention Christ dying for anybody's sins. Did you notice that? How'd you miss it? You miss it by keep reading back into the Old Testament, the New Testament. When Peter preaches, there is no New Testament. There's not one book, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that haven't written one word. Paul hasn't opened his mouth. As a matter of fact, uh, he's been he's about to kill some Christians instead of believing what they're saying. You must study to show yourself approved unto God, rightly dividing. And when I say dividing, you use the greatest cuss word in the 21st century. That's the one word the UN can't stand, and it's all through the Bible. The Bible is marked by division from cover to cover, including two covenants, an Old Testament and a New Testament. They are divided. There are two different books. In eternity, there are two sets of people, lost and saved. Did you ever notice that? Did you ever notice the division is eternal? And the only time the Bible speaks about things, all things coming back to God, in 1 Corinthians 15, it's all things that are part of Him and Him part of them, including His Son and all, his, all the converts. Nothing is t- told you about the devil going back to God at all, although there are some theologians that teach that. So what you're coming in here in Acts chapter 2 is Peter preaching what he's been told to preach by Jesus, And he's not been told about the atonement, which is why he never mentions it. The atonement is something that's revealed to Paul. And you won't find Simon Peter or any of the rest of them doing what they're doing or writing what they write, like in the epistle of Peter, until they've been at the count conference in Acts chapter 15 and learned about Christ dying for sins to save people from hell. Peter doesn't mention it anywhere in your lesson today. And you're coming here in Acts chapter 2 and verse 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, and 31, 32. And that's not the gospel Paul preached. Paul said that if any man preached any other gospel, let him be accursed. And Simon Peter preaches another gospel right here and is not accursed. You see how, how much, how much more complex that book is than you thought it was? Why, you say, well, the, the, the Ethiopian eunuch found about the atonement of Christ from Isaiah 53, uh, not when he was in the chariot until Philip got up there and opened it and they were reading it. Why, Isaiah 53 had been around all through, all through, uh, 800 BC, 700 BC, 600 BC, 500 BC, 400 BC, 300 BC, 200 BC, and the time of Christ, and nobody knew about it. 
and nobody preached it. And where Christ mentions it, he's prophesying something that hasn't even taken place yet. Now, you've got to get a hold of that to get a sound fixation on that book, because if ever a place where a fellow can go to hell, it's in the Sermon on the Mount. That's the best place. It isn't aimed at any Christian, and no Christians there. Those are all Jewish, and they're all Jewish disciples. See how, see how it goes? You must understand the divisions. That's why when you read the Sermon on the Mount, you're finding statement after statement that you have no business doing at all. Like cutting off, cutting out your eyes or your arms or your legs if they're causing you to sin. That's nonsense in the, in the church age. The church age hasn't been begun. There is no church there in the Sermon on the Mount. That is a, a, a Old Testament Jewish king come to save Israel from her enemies and he's preaching the, the kingdom's, uh, uh, orders and the whole Sermon on the Mount, all five, six, and seven, are the constitution for the second advent of Christ, not the first. And that's how you keep getting your Bible messed up and messed up and messed up and messed up by these dumb, stupid people who profess to believe it and don't. They don't believe it in the parts they don't like. They change them. Now, you stick with the book, and in what you're about to read, there's no plan of salvation given that you can get to heaven all in all. You're simply told that the Jews turned down their Messiah and crucified him, and God didn't let him stay dead. He buried him, for he brought him up from the dead, and asked Israel to believe on him. That's the whole message of Acts 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. And you can't find one time there where he's preaching the gospel that said how Christ died for our sins, according to the Scripture. It isn't there. It's prophesied in the Old Testament. It is not preached in Acts 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. If you don't believe it, read it. So he begins with the Psalm of David, which uh, has much application to your lesson, but it's good reading. The Lord said to my Lord, that it's a reference to Christ. That's what Dave, what Christ pulled on the Pharisees. How, does, how come David calls him Lord if he's his son? The Lord said to my Lord, then this is aimed at a certain man, one, sit thou at my right hand, that doesn't take place till he's gone back up, until I make thine enemies thy footstool, that's the second advent. His enemies are not his footstool, his enemies are running the world and about to bring in the satanic kingdom under the Antichrist. Verse 2, The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion, not now, at the second advent. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. Christ is not ruling now in the midst of his enemies. The devil is ruling now in his friends. And when Christ comes back and sets up his kingdom, he'll rule, and there'll be people in the kingdom in the in uh, 1,000 year reign that are his enemies. Because you are told in Revelation chapter 20 at the end of the millennium, the devil comes back and raises a rebellion and attacks Jerusalem, where Christ is reigning. Get your Bible straight. Verse 3, Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. Thy people, but in the Christian in the lot. You're in the Psalms, another Christian around, nobody knows what a Christian is, nobody ever heard of one. Thy people. Thy people in the Old Testament are thy people in the Old Testament, and thy people are the Jewish nation, the people of Israel, every time, and there isn't a Christian in the lot. Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power, second advent. He didn't come in power in the first time, he came to die on a cross. Get it right! If you believe the book, start believing the book instead of trying to mess with it. Thy people should be willing in the day of thy power, in the beauty of holiness, second advent, from the womb of the morning, Christ coming like the sun coming up. Thou hast the dew of thy youth. Christ comes back. He was thirty-three and a half years old when he left, and he's thirty-three and a half years old when he comes back. The same Jesus that you saw go up, Acts chapter 1, shall come like you saw him go. He went at thirty-three and a half. That's when he's coming back. All right, four. The Lord hath sworn. This is from Psalm. I'm reading from this the passages from the Psalms, and this is Psalm chapter uh, ten, verse one to four. 
the Lord has showed, uh, the Lord has sworn that it's got to be true, it's bound to be true, and will not repent. Thou art, this is aimed at who, aimed at who? It's aimed at the one whom the Lord said, My Lord. It's aimed at Jesus Christ. When the people be willing in the day of his power, and he's going to come in the morning like the sun coming up. The Lord has sworn and will not repent, quote, Thou art a priest. Christ is a king and priest and prophet. And this age here, he hasn't come down as king yet, but he's going to come down as king when he comes. And in the meantime here, he's our great high priest. Thou art a priest after the order of Melchizedek. And when he was on this earth, he was a prophet. He was prophet, priest, and king. Prophet coming down to die for your sins and buried and rose from the dead. A priest at the right hand of God interceding for you. And when he comes back, King of kings and Lord of lords. All right, now from the book of Acts, Simon Peter reporting, verse 22. Ye men of Israel, not a Christian in the lot. Ye men of Israel, everyone there is a Jew or a Jewish proselyte. Did you read the chapter? There isn't a Christian presence. There isn't, a, there isn't a, anywhere there a Gentile present who isn't a Jewish proselyte circumcised and coming to Pentecostal feast to observe a Jewish feast. Ye men of Israel, look it up. Take it for one, for one time, pick up that book and take your marker and read Acts chapter 2 and Mark every time you see that thing's aimed at a Jew. And you'll find it is aimed at nobody but a Jew, unless it's a Jewish proselyte who has, uh, has, uh, has embraced Judaism as a circumcised son of Israel. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by means of miracles and wonders. That's obvious, although it's not written. When you read it, you read it written after uh, showing up after Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you keep thinking about all that stuff has uh, uh, been done there, and all that stuff belongs to the uh, New Age with Christ dying for your sins, and it doesn't. The first uh, you, 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 uh, Matthew chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 is Old Testament. Mark chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 9, 9, 10 is Old Testament. Luke chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 is Old Testament. A man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders, which Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John record later. They certainly aren't recording at the time Peter says this, which God did by him in the midst of you, as yourselves also know. Him, I'm referring to Christ, being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, that is, God knew what was going to take place and determined it to play, take place and for a purpose, which he doesn't give. And on ago, he says, being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, what has he done? He hasn't died for anybody. Because before, for the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God for Peter to Israel is, ye have taken, Israel took him, and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. No mention of him dying for anybody. He didn't say you killed the Savior of the world. He didn't say kill the one who died for your sins. He said you took your wicked hands and you crucified and slain him, and they didn't do that either, literally. Their hands had nothing to do with the crucifixion. He'd been in Herod's hand and Pilate's hand long before that. And when he died on the cross, there wasn't a Jew there who put in a nail, and there wasn't a Jew there that whipped him. But he says, by wicked hands, you have crucified and slain. Oh, I, by proxy, uh, b b before the fact and after the fact, that is, they were the ones who were responsible for him getting killed. And although they didn't pound in the nails and didn't uh, whip him with the whip, they were responsible for his crucifixion and his being slain. Not one word about him dying for anybody. Did you notice that? Quote, The road to hell is paved with good intentions. And quote, the scripture is one of them. Have crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up, death and burial, no atonement. It isn't even mentioned. And Peter had been a disciple of Christ, 
for three and a half years. And now he's preaching the gospel Paul didn't preach. He's omitting the atonement. Why? He doesn't know about it. Christ doesn't reveal to him. It's revealed to Paul. And that's why Paul calls it my gospel. And that's why Paul said, if any man preach other gospel, what I'm preaching, let God curse him. Well, Peter isn't preaching it here, and God isn't cursing him. You say, why not? It hasn't been revealed yet. It is revealed in Acts chapter 8 to an Ethiopian eunuch. Read it. Don't you take a word for me to be the truth. Read it. Whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it is not possible he should be holden of sin, or holden of, de- holden of death. The, 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 yes, the pains of death, and they couldn't hold him. Or he said, of death. For David speaketh concerning him, prophecy, I foresaw the law or before me, no atonement, before my face, no atonement. For he is in my right hand, the atonement not mentioned, that I should not be moved, in the atonement not mentioned. Now you see how you keep running into that thing? If you want to go to hell, Acts chapter 2 and the Sermon on the Mount are two of the quickest ways you can get there. And if you want three or four more, I'll tell you where they are. One of them is Hebrews chapter 6, one of them is Hebrews chapter 4, one of them is Hebrews chapter 10, and any place in the, in the Revelation will push you out, because in the Revelation it says three times that a man cannot be saved by the new birth, or cannot be saved by faith in the shed blood of Christ, but he must believe on Christ, and, quote, keep the commandments of God. He mentioned it two times directly and two times indirectly in the book of Revelation. Better watch your step. It'll rightly divide the word of truth. And that statement I'm quoting, every time you hear me quote it, don't you remember, don't you forget, that's not found in your newer Bibles. They took out study to show thyself approved unto God. They took out rightly dividing. You know why? Because Satan was the author. And he's the God of this world. And he is subtle like nothing you ever saw before anything God made. And when he wants to mess up that book, he does it with the people who profess to believe it. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh shall rest in hope. That's Christ talking about Christ. How do you know it is? Because he compares it with David in verse 29. And verse 27 is not verse 29. There is a division. And once you get rid of the convictions, you get rid of the truth. Uh, the the uh, divisions, you get rid of the truth. And you must get rid of, them, rid of them now to be sane in this age. In this age, an insane man is a man who believes in separation, division, and independency. That's a, that's a, that's a radical queer. And the people who are the nice, sweet people are the people who want a united nations, united states, united Soviet socialistic republic. The word is unite. That's how subtle the devil is. That's a good motive, isn't it? Everybody get together. Not in the New Testament or the Old Testament. That Jew had an extreme division from all the rest of the other countries. None of them had. That's why people are anti-Semitic. The whole Old Testament, which is three quarters of the Bible, puts one nation above the rest of the nations. And a 2,000 years of a, a dispersion gathered, gathered, scattered abroad doesn't stop them. They're going to come back and take over the nations. They won't be the United Nations except under Israel. That's why nearly all the nations are anti-Semitic. Because the one who is the God of this world and who gives the nations their kings, according to the New Testament, Luke 4, according to him, it's going to be united only under him. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I'll be like the Most High. So the unit word, the bloody word today is unite, get together, get together, get together. How do you do it? Get rid of differences. Get rid of the thing that enables you to understand the book. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that is not to be ashamed, 
rightly dividing, not uniting. Rightly dividing, division, separation, isolation. It winds up with unsaved people in a lake of fire and saved people in New Jerusalem divided, not together, not supposed to be together. In plain words, the most cussed out, hated book in the world today is the Bible, and in order to bring in the United Kingdom of Satan with the son of perdition as the Antichrist running the world, you must get rid of the book. And the way to get of it, you get rid of the book, is make things together. They're all saved the same way in the Old Testament they are in the New. Therefore, you can preach the Old Testament as salvation. Now that you know about it, how do you know about it? By the New Testament. Then if you reject the New Testament, then you can't preach the Old Testament. And so forth and so on. The two are different. They're different. They're different. They're different. And as long as you go by the unity, you're right in line with the devil's program. God never told you to be unequally yoked with an unbeliever under any condition in the New Testament. Got to get the book, folks. You got to get the book. You never get with this modern bunch of teachers. I wouldn't hire them to teach a daily vacation Bible school. Therefore did my heart rejoice and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh shall rest in hope. That's Christ. Because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. Then he went down and went through there. How many days? Three and a half days. Sure as you live. Day and night, day and night. As Jonah was in the belly of the whale three days and three nights, so must the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. He was down there. He went down there. He went through there, and he came back up. And Peter doesn't say one word about him dying for anybody's sins. Not a word. He just says that Christ's soul wasn't left in hell when he went down and came back up. Neither wilt thou suffer thy Holy One to see corruption. He's talking about that. Not one word about him dying for anybody. He died, and he died, and the Israelites crucified him, and he didn't stay down. He came up after going down through hell and coming up after three days and three nights. Period. And that is not the gospel Paul preached. I delivered unto you, what? That Christ died, one, he died, two, he died for your sins, and that's aimed at Gentiles. Not a word about it in Acts chapter 2, or 3, or 4, or 5, or 6, or 7. Verse 27, Because thou wilt not leave thy soul in hell, neither wilt thou see suffer thy holy one, the body up in the tomb, to see corruption. The body came, came, came back again without any corruptible thing about it because he was sinless. Men and brethren, men and brethren, verse 30, 39, all of them Jews or proselyte to Judaism, not a Christian in the lot. Men and brethren, let me freely speak to you of the patriarch David, that he, not like what he's been reading, he's different, that he is both dead, and Christ is not dead, and buried, and Christ is not buried, he came up, and his sepulchre is with us to this day. You can't find Christ's sepulchre. You find the place where they said he was buried, but it doesn't say, here lies so-and-so. Every cemetery you go to has the man's name on his, on his sepulchre. You can't find Christ. And if you did, the guy would be lying. He is not here. Quote, he is risen. Verse 30, therefore being a prophet, and knowing this is David, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, as from his body would come the kingly succession, according to the flesh, that is the physical man, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He never got on David's throne. He's not on David's throne right now. There's a difference. The throne he's on now is the right hand of the Father in glory, and when he comes back, he'll be on David's throne because the angel promised Mary that when he announced the birth of Christ. The Lord shall give him the throne of his father, not God, his father, David. Hasn't happened yet. 31. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell. He went down and came back up. Neither did his flesh see corruption. His body didn't rot when it was in the grave. Three, three days and three nights, it didn't rot. 
This Jesus hath God raised up, resurrection, whereof we are all witnesses. He preached the death, the burial, the resurrection of Christ, without mentioning him dying for anybody, or praying for anybody, paying for anybody's sins, or reconciling the world to himself, or starting a church. Not one cotton-picking word in Acts 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and the first man that got the atonement was an Ethiopian eunuch in chapter 8, and he only got it by Philip uh, uh, interpreting Isaiah 53, which Isaiah couldn't interpret, and a Jeremiah couldn't interpret, and uh, uh, Malachi couldn't interpret it, and Peter, James, and John did not interpret when they walked with Christ for three and a half years on this earth. It was a revelation given to Paul, and that's why I call it my gospel. You've got to get the division. You've got to see the difference. And if you think they're the same, there's something wrong with your noodle. You need to go back and take a remedial reading, something, something or third grade spelling. God help you. God help you, brother and sister. And God help you to understand the book. And may God open its riches to you, and may you get them right, and may you obey the commandment to study. And study yourself not approved unto men, but approved unto God. A workman, you've got to work at it. My workman, rightly dividing the word of truth. Go against the age, the gay age is for everybody getting together. You try to pull as many lost or mild as you can and get them saved so they don't belong to the big get-together. They become Christ instead of the devils. May the Lord bless you and good day.